Tannenberg from Julia Computing, giving a talk about Julia for data analysis. Thank you. So I'm a bit of an imposter here talking about Julia at a Python conference, um, but I'll try and talk about how uh, Julia works with Python. And in fact, I'm giving this talk in a IPython notebook, which is a good sign. Um, I don't actually have any data of my own to talk about. So here's a uh, nice little plot I've dug up. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the raw data, but it's a uh, probability. It's a study on uh, success, parole success for prisoners. Uh, and it's a probability of parole during over the time of day. And so you can see there's a nice drop off before lunch. So hopefully that doesn't all go badly for my talk. So what is Julia? Uh, it's, well, fairly simply, is a dynamic, high performance language. Uh, originally designed for technical computing, but it's starting to become much more broad. Uh, the syntax, I guess, is very heavily influenced by Python with a smattering of MATLAB and a few other things. Um, so here's a nice example I've got here. Uh, it's, as you can see, the main sort of syntactic differences from Python, which are surprisingly contentious, apparently, uh, like if you read Hacker News. Uh, Basically, rather than significant white space, you use an end block, and it's one-based indexing. But if you can live with that, which is actually turns out to be very easy, then it, uh, you'll pick it up very quickly if you're familiar with Python. So why Julia? Um, why would you want to use it? Fundamentally, if you want to write fast, efficient code in one language, so you don't want to write, um, have to write something in Python and then dump it into C or Fortran, et cetera. So avoids what we term the two language problem. Um, the other really nice thing about it is it makes it very easy to sort of peek under the hood. You can see what is actually going on at each step of your computation, why it's slow, how you can make it faster, et cetera. Um, for example, most of Julia itself is written in Julia. A uh, very su surprisingly small bit of it is actually written in anything else. Um, and at each stage of the computation, you can step through it and go, right, here's what it's doing as it gets converted from the code I wrote to actually machine code. Um, also, it's free, which is always good. And it's surprisingly fun. And finally, it plays very nicely with sort of existing tool chains. Um, and that's certainly improving as we go on. So the sort of single most important things to know about Julia, uh, firstly, are types. So roughly analogous to Python classes, but somewhat different in the sense of, well, firstly, every object has a type. So the type of one is a flight 64. Firstly, I'll just run this function. Uh, the type of a function is a function. And a type of a type is a data type. We can declare new types uh, just with a type with what's called a type keyword. And then you can construct objects of those types. Firstly, the one really important thing to say is that unlike many dynamic languages, types in Julia, the user-defined types are just as fast as the built-in types. Uh, there's no reason that they, there's no, they're not like second-class citizens that you have to then go hack in to get, to make fast, you have to go use all these lower levels constructions. You can just use the user-defined types straight up. The other very important thing to know about Julia and where it diverges significantly from other object-oriented languages is that uh, Julia functions don't belong, Julia functions are generic, uh, and they don't belong to a type. So uh, we define a function here. So uh, we can call, so this defines a function. It does two things. If it's, the argument is a floating point number, it prints x as a float, and if it's an integer, it prints something else. Um, so this is a different, slightly different syntax. It's sort of a nice one-line syntax for writing functions, which becomes very useful when you have to write a lot of them like this. Uh, and this double colon is, uh, is what's called the type specification, or type uh, specifies the types that is acceptable to the input. And so if we call it with a, a, uh, a floating point number, we get the one is a float, and then one is an integer. And so as I mentioned, unlike traditional object-oriented languages, uh, Functions don't belong to a uh, particular type. That's a bit of, uh, so what that means is that also we have what's called multiple dispatch. And that dispatch, 
how a function, how a method is particular, a particular method, so each one of these is a method uh, in, inside the function, which method is chosen is determined by all the arguments of the function, not just the first one. So it's not, uh, so which makes it very, can make it much more powerful uh, to write uh, certain, uh, certain objects. So for, for example, here we have a, uh, the expression, we can add some more methods. So the, each, each of these takes two arguments. So the first one uh, takes a float64 and an integer. The second one takes any real numbers. And the last one is a generic method that takes any object whatsoever. So if we, uh, each one of those then dispatches to the correct method, as you would hope, purely based on the arguments. Uh, and for example, then, if you want to show how that particular um, object is printed, we st uh, so for that baz object we defined earlier, uh, this is handled by the show function. Uh, so, and show is a generic function, and it's made up of these different methods. Uh, we can view all those by typing show. It's the methods of show. And so, as you can see, there's 105 of them. And each, so, each, so when you call show on a particular object, it looks up to see which one. Um, and the, first, the other thing you'll notice is that every, uh, most of these are two method, two, sing, two, object, uh, two argument methods. And what this means is that most of these show methods take in what's called an IO object as a first argument. So this leads, lets you to write to different places. So you can write to standard out, you can write to buffers, files, et cetera. Uh, and then there's a generic fallback, sing, there's a generic method called, which takes a single argument, which then just prints it to the standard uh, out. Uh, so if we want to overwrite show, we first imp uh, import it, and then we assign a new method for this Baz object. And then when we now display it, it just prints using our new method. So that's the rough idea of uh, multiple dispatch, so we can exploit this. And this becomes very powerful, uh, especially when we start dealing with much more com uh, complicated schemes. So uh, a really nice example is matrix multiplication. So if you have uh, trying to do a matrix multiplication, uh, we can have different matrix types. So Julia has like uh, this tri uh, there's a standard dense matrix, there's sparse matrices, there's uh, then sort of structure matrices like uh, diagonals and tridiagonals. Uh, and each of these can then dispatch onto the correct, so if you're multiplying two types of matrices, you can dispatch then onto the fastest matrix multiplication method. You don't need to fall back to a, sta you know, a standard triple for loop method of doing it. Uh, the final, the other, really sort of important ingredient in Julia, which makes it fast, is what's just-in-time compilation. Uh, so basically, every time you call a function, uh, it's just-in-time compiled down to the, uh, to, uh, down to sort of machine instructions, and then uh, is then executed. So functions are the fundamental unit at which all Julia uh, methods are compiled. And so the first tip, the, when people first start using Julia, they'll complain it's slow, and then this first, the single fast, easiest way to improve your code is to put it all inside a function, and then you call it, and then suddenly it's magically faster. The other one is, the other trick is uh, somewhat, a little bit more involved, but uh, to get the most out of Julia, and particularly how it works internally, use the trick called type inference. So when it starts the compilation process, it goes through and tries to fi figure out what actually the type of each, of each uh, variable is in your, uh, in your program, your function. Uh, and so to do that efficiently, you need to sort of get a, and you develop a knack over time of writing what's called type stable code so that as the program executes, the type of a variable doesn't change. Uh, and somewhat, you see this for certain things. For example, uh, this is an example why, for example, square root of negative one doesn't promote to a complex type because otherwise we would be converting, uh, if you when the compiler were to see a square root of a floating point number, it wouldn't know whether it would, the, out, the result would be a, a, a floating point number or a complex number. So you need to explicitly run it complex. Uh, and this pops up in a few other cases. Another one is that integer arithmetic by default doesn't, uh, unlike Python, it doesn't uh, promote to big integers, to arbitrary precision big integers, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to have fast integer arithmetic. And so for that reason, we can get you know, integer arithmetic is the same as it would be in C, because there's no, none of this uh, branching to see if, it's, if you've accidentally, you know, if you've accidentally gone out of the size of your type and need to promote to this big object. Uh, the other neat trick, which I won't touch on too much, uh, is metaprogramming, uh, and this is something that's really powerful and comes from sort of this Lisp background. Uh, 
the idea is basically that you can actually write Julia code with, uh, so Julia, you can actually manipulate Julia expressions with Julia itself. Um, so if you put, we can sort of quote an expression uh, using this colon syntax, uh, then puts it in a uh, string, then it gives you expression object, um, which we can then, and the other useful thing is then macros, which essentially transform expressions, um, which operate on, on expressions and transform them and then execute them. So uh, these are prefixed with that. So if you're familiar with Python decorate, I mean, obviously, very similar to Python decorators, but much more powerful in how they work, because you can actually manipulate the code inside. Um, a very simple one is simply the time macro, which tells you exactly how long you think it takes to run. Um, and this is a good example of the just-in-time compilation, because you can see that took um, uh, ten, uh, 20th of a second. And then the next time you run it, the uh, time is much slot, much quicker, because now we're at the uh, function I defined earlier has been just-in-time compiled. Uh, and you can actually see what that expands, what the actual code it's doing. Uh, we can sort of expand the macro code. Uh, as you can see, there's the, it sort of essentially is calculating the time, the current time, computes the, ex computes the expression, and then uh, computes the difference in time, prints it, and then returns you the value actually computed about back out. Uh, and these are quite powerful, because as I said earlier, you can sort of view all these uh, stages of the compilation process. Uh, so if with that function we defined earlier, uh, this, the first stage is this sort of type inference process, and so you can see it's a bit of a mess here, but you can see what happened. It sort of tags each uh, expression with what it thinks the uh, type will be. And then it step, the next step down is it steps down to what's called the LVM intermediate representation, which is essentially the, sort of the uh, level that uh, the LVM backend manipulates expressions and does all its optimizations at. And then finally, you can actually go all the way down to what is the assembly that was generated by that resulting expression, um, if you're good at reading assembly. Uh, and macros are really quite powerful. They let you do all sorts of tricks which uh, you would otherwise be quite a, which, a ver which make it, uh, let you do all sorts of very tricks. So a very elegant uh, example is this, is what's called program called, a uh, package called jump, which essentially is a uh, mathematical, uh, yeah, optimization package, uh, sort of a domain-specific language for optimization programs. And so you specify your optimization problem in this language, and then you can it then lets you call all sorts of different optimization packages like Groby, Cplex, et cetera, um, automatically without having to then change your program to uh, change the different backend optimi optimizers. Uh, and then finally, which is the rest of my talk I'm going to talk about, are the packages. So Julia has a very extensive and growing sort of third-party package ecosystem, obviously, uh, and very uh, easy to add packages just by a package.add within Julia. Uh, and pack Julia packages, in case you're ever searching for them, are typically suffi suffixed with a .jl extension, uh, which makes them very easy to search for, which is actually good. So you can search for something .jl you usually get the first, Julie, first Google hit. So the next one. Uh, so the title, topic of my talk was talking about the uh, Julia for data science. I'm going to talk about some of the packages that are particularly powerful for Julia, uh, using Julia in this sort of setting. Uh, a very simple one is what's called distributions package. Uh, so as the name would suggest, it essentially provides support for different probability distributions. Um, and it's a very elegant object-based structure. So each class of distributions is a type. So if you want a gamma, op gamma distribution, you just uh, construct a gamma object. Various, uh, and then all the various methods then can be applied directly to these objects. Uh, so you can compute the means, the variances, uh, and then CDFs, uh, et cetera, and then call random number, uh, compute random numbers from those distributions. There's also some very basic, uh, some simple estimation functionality. So if you want to fit then the result of those random numbers to a gamma distribution, uh, you can compute that. Or if you want to see what, how good a normal distribution that would fit, you can et cetera, do that sort of thing. Uh, so we can pass types directly to these functions as well. Um, and then it's in, one of the nice things about them is under the hood, uh, these distributions are defined as what's known as an immutable type, uh, which lets you do all sorts of sort of uh, optimizations which aren't really possible in all the languages. So for example, um, allows to sort of, because it knows the immutable, it's an immutable type, it knows it can be represented exactly by those two uh, fields, it's uh, those two parameters, uh, 
you can do things like you can allocate those uh, sort of distributions on the stack. And so essentially, there's no overhead to creating and destroying these objects, unlike many other languages where if you create a new object of a particular class, it has to then allocate the object, then destroy the object when you're done, et cetera. Um, and there's also lots of efficient methods for multivariate distribution. Um, so multivariate, particularly sort of normal distributions, where it will pre-compute Kolesky factors or also exploit known structure. So if we want to uh, construct a uh, multivariate normal with a diagonal covariance, uh, you can see it creates what's known as a zero mean uh, normal di. Um, so it knows it has a zero mean. It also has a, knows a diagonal covariance. So it can then exploit that structure to do the computations much faster than it would if it was you had a full dense uh, covariance structure. And then we can obviously then compute random numbers from that distribution. Uh, so the, the other packet, next package, which is probably of most uh, use in sort of standard data manipulation, is what's called data frames. Um, so it's a very s provides sort of standard tabular data functionality of heterogeneous columns, very similar to sort of uh, R's data frame or Pandas in Python, those sort of things. Uh, so we can load the package. Um, so there's various functions. So read table for loading CSV files. Um, there's a read RDA for loading R, compressed the RDA format. Um, there's also nice packages for importing there's sort of extra plugins for importing from straight from databases, so SQLite, Postgres, et cetera. Uh, and then we construct them. Uh, but you can also construct them directly from vectors. So if we construct a data frame, uh, so it's a construct it from various, uh, it's from three different vectors. Or alternatively, uh, it also supports a nullable, uh, like nullable thing objects via these NA values. Um, and so we use this at data macro for letting us specify NA objects in the uh, vectors. Um, and you'll notice here we're not actually restricted to using sort of uh, numbers or strings in the data in the uh, columns. We can actually pass any dual there object in there. So, for example, in this column, I've got a column. I've got a column of distributions. So, a good way to get sample data sets is this R data sets package, which just loads the uh, all the all the has all the data sets that come with wrapped up in R. So, this is the standard Iris data set, which. Almost every is sort of drummed into statisticians from the, when they uh, start learning, uh, and you can do sort of standard, very standard data manipulations, uh, very similar syntax to pandas. Uh, instead of strings for index, we use what's uh, there's, uh, Julia has symbols which are uh, prefixed with a colon, so you don't have to you don't put everything in quotes. You use these symbols. Um, so, so subsetting uh, gives you a column. Uh, you can also do standard row column indexing, uh, and you can subset by indexing via, um, and you can, so the dot, here the dot, uh, in, in case you're wondering, that dot um, less than is the sort of the vectorized form of the less than sign. So if you're taking, since vectors can't be compared less than exactly, the dot means that it's a, a element-wise um, less than. Uh, and we also support sort of rough, sort of similar, the what's known as this sort of Hadley-Wickham sort of split, apply, combine approach. Uh, so what we have here is for by this is a by function. Uh, you, could, you have the iris data set. You have the species, species is the name of the variable you want to split by. And then you can apply a function to each of those uh, sort of sub data sets. So this short hand, this short arrow is sort of a lambda. Uh, lets you specify uh, uh, anonymous functions. And so you can see here we have we've split there and then computed the mean of a, this column. Uh, the next one other very elegant package is this. Uh, so for plotting, Julia doesn't actually come with any inbuilt plotting software as of yet. Sort of we're letting him. Uh, there's various plotting packages out there. Um, we're let, I'll give you an overview of two of them. In this talk. Um, I guess we'll see how it goes to uh, which one will win, and then eventually, I guess, we'll in incorporate it into a uh, standard library. But um, the most popular one is, and very powerful one, is this uh, Gadfly. Um, it takes a little while to get going, unfortunately, because of all the compilation going on in the background, it, cause, because it does actually quite a lot. Um, so roughly speaking, it's inspired by this sort of grammar of graphics that's also used by the uh, GGE plot 2 package in R. Um, 
So as a very simple, here we pass an x and a y as a uh, as, as a x and y vectors, um, and it gives you an SVG output. It also is very nice. It's an interactive SVG output, so you can zoom in and out and drag things around. So this is just a simple SVG file with a bit of JavaScript tacked onto it. Uh, so if you save this, if I save this app, uh, file, you, you know everyone can, you'll still get the same interactive features. So it's very nice and portable, uh, a very powerful scheme. Um, it also plays very nicely with data frames. So if I have that iris data set from before, uh, we get our sort of very nice uh, colored pictures. And of course, we can uh, zoom in. Uh, the geometry, uh, so here we've, you specify the coordinates. Uh, so in this sort of grammar graphics construction, you specify the coordinates by keyword arguments. So the first coordinate is steeple width, y is the steeple length, and then your color, which is one of these other coordinates, is the uh, specified by species. Uh, if we could also change that, for example, to petal width, and then you get a nice uh, gradient type color there as well. Uh, the geometry, it is what's, what's different than the other, uh, so it supports these different facets. So the first one is the uh, the uh, the geometry, the uh, coordinates. The other one is these geometries. So um, you pass these as extra arguments. So a simple one, you pass a line plot. Uh, you pass geom as a, uh, so these geom dot objects as a line. Uh, it also supports uh, various uh, sort of simple statistical functionality such as histogram and density. So we get these density. Uh, histogram and density plots of the variables, and also supports lots of other things, nice things like themes, uh, so you can keep consistent themes, uh, scale, scale uh, so log scales, et cetera, and uh, units on your axes, which is very nice. Uh, and so the next package, uh, so GLM provides a, a sort of linear and generalized linear model framework um, for Julia. It's, Roughly similar to, it uh, uses a sort of a similar formula syntax to R for anyone who's encountered that before. So this uh, tilde sort of does a little bit of macro trickery in the background. Um, so it lets you, so it quotes this sort of expression C, um, as a, so we can write, uh, so we can use this sort of very, form, very similar formula syntax. Uh, it's slightly different because of how the, um, the operator precedence changes from R. But we can do a fit linear model. So rather than calling the function directly, we call the object type and then uh, call and fit. And that will fit our sort of simple linear model to the data. And then, of course, we can um, then use that model to predict uh, new objects to, to get the fitted values by predict. Um, so we'll assign that to a new column in IRIS, and then we can plot the results, the predicted versus the observed, um, along a nice uh, axis there. And so that gives you sort of an idea of the difference, how good our predictions are. Um, and then finally, one other very nice package, uh, these, if you've ever used mixed effects models, um, so sort of the current workhorse one is this LME4 package in R. Uh, but its author actually has recently moved to writing all this uh, code in Julia, and this, the result is this uh, mixed models package. Uh, so if we we'll load some quite a nice reasonable sized data set, so this is a uh, like uh, da, da, da. I believe this is data, uh, student evaluation data. Um, and so it's 73,000 rows. And we can fit, uh, so it supports this uh, very similar syntax to R, where you specify the random effects via this uh, bar syntax. And it should take a few seconds. Uh, but you can fit quite very nice uh, and very large, actually, complicated models in this. Uh, So that took seven seconds uh, to fit what is actually a reasonably complicated model. These are, if you fit mixed effects models, you know how complicated these things can get. And that took seven seconds that time, but that was because it was compiling it. If we run it again, then it's much quicker. Uh, so other sort of statistics and data packages that you'd be of interest, uh, there's lots of like, hypothesis testings, uh, hypothesis tests, uh, kernel density estimators, uh, then like sort of penalized regression, so Lasso and GLMNet are all supported very well. Uh, and it's growing and growing and growing. So um, the other thing I want to talk about is how 
Julia can interact with our languages. So obviously, as a new language, it can't compare with sort of the sheer breadth of libraries written in R and Python and those sort of things. Uh, but it makes it very, very easy to interface with these. Uh, the nature of the language makes it very, very easy to interface with these. Um, so for the simplest ones being C, uh, you can, it has a very, very simple interface for calling C, existing C libraries. So here I'm calling the, uh, the libm, the math library, calling the power function. Um, it takes two arguments. Uh, the uh, takes uh, uh, it takes two arguments: the uh, bottom and the exponent. Uh, both of which are doubles, and then it returns a double argument as a result. And so if we do that, it simply then calls out very easily. Um, there's also very other low-level functions which you can use to uh, interface with C. Uh, C function for calling, creating C-compatible function pointers, uh, and then things like unsafe store and unsafe load for loading bi binary blobs straight into Julia. Um, and then once is what's really neat is when you compile this with like metaprogramming, it makes it very easy for generating um, like for wrapping existing libraries. You don't have to then type out all these individually. You can just have a program that generates all these uh, C call statements and then gives your, gives your resulting library, you get a very nice wrapper for existing libraries. Um, being Python, we also want to talk about PyCall. Uh, so I start up PyCall. It actually initializes a Python interpreter in the background. Uh, and then we can evaluate sort of strings in Python. So this is just calling a Python, so executing a Python statement and then evaluating it and then returning it as a Julia object. Uh, so it returns the uh, Python lists get converted back to a Julia array. Uh, there's also a slightly nicer uh, interface is pyimport statement. So if we run pyimport macro, uh, creates a new uh, Julia module math and then imports all the Python uh, all the Python functions in that into this Julia library. So we can math.sign is uh, is a simply is wrap around the pi object, which we can actually call directly. Uh, and so it's, we pass a Julia number, gets passed to the Python function, calls, evaluates, and then gets converted back to the Julia all sort of seamlessly. Um, so if there's a matching Julia type, so for things like dictionaries and arrays and numbers, things that strings, everything's converted automatically. Uh, if there's not, you get a, a what's called a pi object wrapper. Um, one of the only sort of slight hassle with this is that Julia doesn't support overloading the dot operator, so we can't call d dot uh, to integral. So instead, you have to use a slightly, slightly ugly uh, get index, uh, get index notation. But nevertheless, it works quite well. So we're calling the this is the same as calling the dot to integral. Uh, NumPy. So NumPy arrays actually use exactly the same memory layout. Uh, as Julia arrays. Uh, so we can actually pass, so you can convert them directly uh, between the two. Um, in fact, uh, I think it's Julia arrays you can pass directly to NumPy uh, without any uh, copying. So if you had correct instruct array Julia, NumPy sees it. It doesn't have to allocate a new array. Um, I think the other way back, though, it does have to allocate a new array due to the intricacies of getting all these things to work well. Uh, but it makes it very easy to call sort of NumPy, fun have sort of existing NumPy code, or if you've got code that uses NumPy to, um, you know, can use Julia, uh, Julia objects. Uh, and you can even pass Julia functions directly to Python functions, which accept lambdas. So scipy to optimize, we're passing this Julia anonymous function, which calls, um, so with this Julia anonymous function, we're passing to the scipy so.newton uh, with initial I starting one, starting value of one, and then does some Newton iterations, and then gives us a number back. So that's very seamless. There's a great example of someone I was going to put in it, uh, you know, having a factorial statement which calls alternates between Julia and Python all the way down to give you your, a very inefficient implementation of factorial, but I uh, decided to leave it out. Um, finally, PyPlot. You can also load matplotlib by this py import, but there's this pyplot uh, package which is just makes it a little bit nicer to use. Um, so, uh, and lets you use map, so if you've got lots of matplotlib syntax, you can use it almost directly, translate it directly into Julia. Uh, so if you're, in, consider yourself, since every plotting package, you know, there's, there's always this big learning curve into learning a plot, all the intricacies of a plotting package. If you just want to take your matplotlib knowledge and use it straight to Julia, it works basically exactly as you expect it would. Um, so we've got a Julia, two Julia vectors, 
uh, and then we pass them straight into this, uh, this plot function, which is calling matplotlib, and you get your sinusoidally modulated sinusoid. Uh, and you see it's, still, it's actually giving you a Python object in the background, but is, uh, it's printing it out here. Uh, and then there's also this PyJulia package, which essentially is, does the opposite. Um, and it does the opposite by loading this Py call internally and operating backwards. So you can call, um, you know, call the two functions between themselves. Uh, the other one being data, you necessarily need to sometimes come across R. Uh, so R call, as you would expect, does, operates very similar to Py call. Uh, so this is an R import macro, which is very similar. So you can load, uh, unfortunately, there's a, a Julia object called base, so I can't load it as base, but I can load it as R base. Uh, and then we can call sort of Julia functions. So the, if you're familiar with the C function, constructs uh, vectors in R, and so we can call that directly, and we get our, uh, it gives us an R object back. Uh, we don't return Julia objects natively because uh, there's, R has a lot of fancy wrapping, so like it's NA handling does by essential values and stuff, does all sorts of trickery, so it's easier just to keep them as R objects in this case. They don't match up quite as nicely as Python does. Uh, and then oh, get index works, so we can get the, uh, the first, the eighth element, or the B element of this, uh, of this R vector. Um, and plotting packages work remarkably well. So we can call this, uh, so I'm just setting the, uh, this just sets the output to use SVG. Uh, and then we can, path, we can call the uh, R graphics. So the, the, this is this calling the standard R plot function. Um, unfortunately, if you've ever used R in ED detail, you'll know it does some very weird, one of its quirks is what's called non-standard evaluation, which means that unlike any other language, it actually looks at the arguments you, so what you pass into a function affects it, not just their values. Um, and it's very hard to replicate that in Julia elegantly, um, because simply Julia is much more standard in its evaluation. Uh, and so usually when you do a plot of a vector in R, you would see um, it would just put an X here, because that's the name of the variable you put into it. Um, but of course, we can't, Julia doesn't have any way of giving it the name of the vector that you pass to it. Uh, so instead it prints out all the values, which is somewhat ugly. Um, the other problem is that R has lots of syntax which doesn't match up, so it has these uh, square brackets and double square brackets, and then it uses dots in variable names, which obviously conflicts with the Julia syntax. Um, so instead what there is is this very elegant way called uh, uh, non-standard string literals. Uh, so you can view these as sort of uh, somewhat similar to Python, IPython magics, but on steroids. Um, so what this does is calls the... So um, when you prefix a string with a, some sort of, with a, some string of variables, it actually is calling a macro, which changes the code to do something else. Uh, so here, what I'm doing is calling plot uh, dollar on dollar $x. So dollar just does substitution. So whenever dollar isn't valid R syntax, which is basically only when it appears between two variable, two uh, symbols, you can, it will do substitution of the corresponding Julia variable. So remember X back here was a vector, so we do do this, and it calls the, so it's essentially passing it as R, and then converts the uh, Julia syntax. And you can actually view what that, we can use that, um, see what that does. We can do the macro expand. So you can see what it's actually doing. It's calling the R, it's substituting the dollar $x for the, uh, the, this variable, and then calls the R parser on that. Um, and this makes it very easy to, and then it returns an R object back, which in this case is the plot. Well, actually, is the um, returns nothing back, but it gets, spits a plot out in the uh, spits a plot out. Um, and you can actually also substitute. You don't have to use R, uh, Julia variables. You can put whole Julia expressions in this dollar syntax. So I can plot Julia functions directly, um, simply by passing in, uh, simply by passing in putting between this dollar. So it makes it very seamless to implement, to uh, interoperate between the two. Uh, so if we load this, so now we're using the R data sets package to load the Iris data set into Julia. Then uh, loading the, we load the ggplot2 package in R and then call the ggplot2, ggplot function with the Iris data set loaded in and then use the various variable names. And the resulting object gets, so this gets converted to an R data frame and then we can then just use that as we would a usual R data frame to give you a nice uh, ggplot2 plots. 
Uh, and finally, we can also then fit sort of linear models as well. So you have uh, things like uh, LM. Uh, we can pass variables directly there. Uh, pass the pass the uh, object data frame through the variable, and then we get this uh, vector back. Um, and then you can do things like uh, so model. It's a coef. And then you can then obviously model is just an ob R object, which you can then get its particular vectors back. Uh, and then if you want to convert that to a Julia object, we can call R copy, which will then just convert it to a nice Julia array. I think if you convert this, it'll give you a dictionary. Yep, there. We can get a dic Julia dictionary back of the uh, corresponding R object. Uh, okay, um, and then as a, similar to PyJulia, there is also RJulia, which then does the opposite for calling Julia from R. Um, it was actually RJulia 2 is sort of the work in progress, I think. I'm not involved in this. But they uh, sort of in call, internally call, uses all this to uh, call Julia, um, R from Julia. Julia from R. Uh, and similarly, there's other, other languages. So Java call for interacting with Java and other JVM languages. Uh, CXX, which is one of these incredible things for writing inline C++. So, um, which is sort of still in development. It's a bit of a, a bit tempestuous, but the uh, essentially you can because Clang and uh, Julia share the same backend, you can actually just call the uh, Clang compiler on C++ code inlined in Julia, and it'll convert it to and give you the correct output. Uh, and LVM call is the uh, other lets you actually call directly inline LVM, or even you can write inline assembly. So inline assembly in dynamic languages is the way to go, I think. Uh, future directions. So uh, we recently got a large sort of bit of money from the Moore Foundation uh, to sort of further expand on this sort of data processing, uh, ecos data science ecosystem in Julia. Uh, and we're still trying to work on these ideas. So things like uh, making the syntax for data minimization manipulation much more convenient. So I mentioned this using uh, macros that you can embed sort of domain specific languages in Julia very easily. So that's sort of one thing we're exploring. So something similar to dplyr or even like link in uh, the .NET languages. Uh, and then obviously we want to support more backends. So there's SQLite and Postgres support, uh, but things like SFrames and Parquet. Uh, and basically we also, just a lot of engineering to make these things faster. So really you have to, to get the most out of this, you have to sort of leverage Julia's type inference uh, functionality. And so that means things like you have to improve the speed of unit. So Currently, uh, union type, so data, you know, t you have to have nullable data, so it can be an object or it can be a null, so we have to make those reasonably performant such that things can be fast. Uh, and then also work on this data modeling. So there's GLMs, but we want to expand this to uh, be able to do these computations out of core, give you sort of nice interfaces, and then uh, also the support for distributed computing. So there's this uh, sort of compute framework, which is a very similar to like these, uh, is sort of the, so we're working at the moment, is this, uh, a DAG, basically a DAG computational schedule in the, in the, in the vein of uh, Spark, et cetera. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs>